CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. The October 24th, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until 31st of March 2025. This meeting is being recorded and the recording may be made publicly available. All materials for this meeting can be found at the link that I am putting in the chat now. We also have a dedicated page on the Conservation Commission website for Thorndike Place proceedings. Please note that the Zoom chat feature may be used for questions and comments that contribute to the Commission's procedures, and if it's used otherwise, it may be disabled at the Chair's discretion. The public comment period will follow each hearing. Naturally, we have just the one hearing. The Conservation Commission encourages attendees to ask questions or comments during the public comment period, and Chuck Taroni, our Commission Chair, will facilitate tonight's meeting. Each vote taken tonight, should there be any, will be conducted by roll call. And we begin with roll call attendance. So Chuck, to you to review. Sure. So well, there's there's only one item on tonight's agenda. Thank you, David. Uh, David, could you give me um, co-host of co-host permissions? And moving on from that, um, we have one item on the agenda tonight. It's Thorndike Place, file number 910356. Um, I'm just going to go through... Oops, I'm just going to go through the agenda and uh, start with Mike Gildas game. Present. Nathaniel Stevens. Present. Susan Chapnick. Here. David White. David White let us know that he's not going to be attending tonight's meeting with the commission. He's recused himself uh, from this proceeding. Um, David Kaplan. Present. Brian McBride. Brian also let us know that he won't be making tonight's meeting. Uh, Sue, uh, Sarah Alfaro Franco. Present. Uh, associate member. Associate member Eileen Coleman. It looks like Eileen's not here. And I just want to let everyone know that Chuck Taroni is also here. Okay. So we have one item on the agenda tonight, and um, and I know that David went over this, but all correspondence is available um, to the public, and for a full list, contact uh, the conservation agent, and he'll put his link in the chat, and if there are any issues, reach out immediately to David. Uh, before we get started, I just want <clears throat> to just go over, um, you know, a little bit of how we've um, arrived here. So this is a continuance from the August 15th conservation meeting, which was continued for peer review purposes. The applicant and their consultant, BSC, submitted material and then updated that material while all along that the Conservation Commission's peer review, which was uh, GCA, was reviewing um, that material and those updated submittals. On October 22nd, 2024, we received the latest GZA submittal. And I understand the October 4th, 2024 response from BSC was posted late on a website. And we have received comments from Arlington residents and the Arlington Land Trust. I apologize for that, um, the meeting, and say that we all uh, need to do our best to keep the public informed. And I believe that the Arlington Conservation Commission has done that, even though along the around the edges, there's been a few minor issues. So with that being said, we'll move on. Um, we have a lot of information to go over tonight and um, <clears throat> at tonight's meeting. And I don't want to make uh, any more or take any more of this time than I need to. So we should get started. And I'm going to ask David Morgan to bring us up to date. Uh, and if at the end of the meeting, the Conservation Commission members feel like they need additional time or they have additional needs that they want the applicant to fulfill, such as documentation or, or whatever, then we'll address uh, a continuance 
at that time. So that would only come up at the end of the meeting. And so with that, I want to turn it over to David Morgan to bring the commission up to date since we spoke last to this applicant on August 15th. Sure. So as you know, you uh, will have received the revised uh, stormwater calculations from BSC and a subsequent peer review by GZA of those new calculations. And I understand that those have been pretty substantial changes to the, the stormwater calculations that I'm confident BSC will, will cover for us tonight. And um, we, we've also received correspondence from uh, MMA, which is the firm that uh, Arlington Land Trust has engaged um, commenting on the GZA peer review. Um, all of those materials, again, are available on the website that I've put in the chat. So I believe that's the update. We'll get into details with the applicants. Okay, um, so at this point, we need to hear from our applicant um, and just to let us know, uh, again, just update the commission on uh, what's been going on since the last time we met. And I see Dominic has turned on his screen. Dominic, are you able to uh, introduce yourself to the commission at this point? Do you have permissions? Uh, sure, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Good evening, I'm Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group, the engineers and land surveyors and landscape architects for the project here on behalf of the applicant for the Thorndike Place residential development. Um, Stephanie Kiefer of Small Act Vaughn. Uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to start. She is sure. here as well. Sure, very good. Um, good evening, everyone. It's It's been a little bit of time since we've gathered. So um, just as a, a Brief introduction before Dom, just because there has been a little bit of a gap. Um, so we uh, we started this project about 14 months ago, if you if you all recall. So it was back in September of 2023 that we filed, and the first hearing was in September of 2023. And since that time, um, we have uh, gone through a, a pretty robust um, review before the commission on this. Uh, the commission has had the benefit of three independent peer reviewers. So you had um, Hatch was the initial stormwater peer reviewer. Um, also, um, SWCA um, reviewed the uh, uh, invasive species and, and uh, wildlife issues. Um, and then most recently, obviously, that we're going to be talking about this evening is uh, GZA was retained to kind of take a look at stormwater standards two and three. Um, in addition to the number of peer reviews, just to refresh everyone's recollection, it was back probably early spring that we had reviewed the um, invasive species and, and closed out that portion of it and, and worked through the commission and the peer reviewers comments. Um, and then in this, this past spring, starting in March, um, at the request of the commission, we started taking additional uh, groundwater results and, and we continued that about on an every other week basis from March until uh, mid to late May of this year. and, and we're very confident of where the estimated seasonal high groundwater is. And um, at least that GZA concurs with us, but I'm sure that I see that GZA, that Anthony Urbano is here, so he can speak to that. Um, but I just kind of wanted to bring us up to date where we were um, this last round of peer review by GZA, um, somewhat discrete issues. And I think that without a little bit of further ado, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Dom, um, but I just want to say that the we've been here for a while. It's been a long road, and there's been a lot of significant input from the commission and its independent reviewers. Um, and we think that where we are today is really responsive to what the commission's questions were. So, um, with that, Dom, if you want to um, give the update of uh, where we last were and, and what's been done in response to GZA peer reviews one and two. Uh, yes, and if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, could would you be okay if I shared a screen? Uh, sure. Okay, hold on one second. Let me just... Uh...
Let me just do it this way instead. Um, there we go. Um, why is this not giving me the right? Um, hold on one second. It's given me a little bit of a goofy issue on sharing. Um, uh, I may seems have to, like we're, I no, may it looks like it, you're starting now. Yeah, I may have to do it that way. I apologize. It's not, it wasn't allowing me to get to the full screen version um, that I have up. So let me actually just uh, try that again and see if it'll just, oh, weird. It does not. Down the bottom next to the uh... Was that the page? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a weird, will not let me full screen version up on my second screen that it would not mm. let me share for some reason. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully everybody can see this uh, okay, I believe. I can see it. Okay. So again, Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group uh, here on behalf of the Thorndike Place Residential Project. So... Um, well, the presentation we're going to go through tonight will will show that uh, through our design and the peer reviews done on behalf of the commission that this project meets or exceeds the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, the project's stormwater management design has been peer reviewed by both Hatch and GZA on behalf of the commission. Um, Hatch's initial peer review uh, demonstrated compliance with standards one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So basically everything really except three. Uh, and it, it demonstrated compliance with three, but not uh, aspects of standard three. Um, at which point the commission brought GZA on board to really look at a few specific items uh, with regards to standard three in particular. Um, one being the seasonal high groundwater elevation that we used in our design. Um, and two being the groundwater mounting methodology. Um, so in their initial review, GZA concluded that um, our seasonal high groundwater elevation, of, a reminder of four, elevation 4.0 was appropriate based on uh, everything that, that has been done and that our groundwater mounting methodology was, was good, but they raised some concerns with regard to the drawdown. So basically how how long that system would take to empty. Um, there's a 72 hour requirement uh, in standard three that basically, basically it's there. So it rains, water comes into the system, it, it infiltrates, that volume is there for ostensibly the next storm. Um, after looking at GZA's review, consulting with amongst ourselves, we made some revisions to the system, uh, to our drainage system and resubmitted those to the commission and GZA. Um, GZA has recently issued a subsequent review that confirmed compliance with that standard three drawdown requirement, our revised groundwater mounting based on our new design and reconfirmed seasonal high groundwater uh, that we were using a four, um, showing again that the project complies entirely with each of the 10 stormwater standards. So, this is what the, the initial design was. This is what you've seen a bunch. Um, I'll kind of give you the quick overview again. Um, the stormwater management system was comprised of a large underground infiltration system here in, in sort of the main parking lot, um, a rooftop detention area that's, it was roughly half the building. So basically what is the, um, rainfall that fell on about half the building would be held on the roof temporarily and, and discharged into this infiltration. Dominic? Yes. Can I ask you to add into your um, review where the jurisdictional setbacks are? I'd like to know myself where yeah. the 100-foot line is. Yep. So the 100-foot line, you can sort of see it right here. It's this blue line right here, comes through, and then is over here. So it kind of bumps up into the bottom of the building there. And then again is over here. And then there's some um, bordering land subject to flooding. It's a little hard to see it's in white 
I can just make it out mostly because I know where it is, that comes through here and again up, up here. All right, so yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, no problem. So as I was saying, that that rooftop detention area holds holds water, releases that at a controlled rate into that infiltration system. We also had smaller infiltration systems in the driveways for the um, townhouse units out front. Um, GZA had also expressed some concern. I'll, I'll get into that in a little more detail with with those systems and the specifics of those systems. So what we did uh, to revise that, and again, I'll go into a lot more detail on this shortly, but quick look, you don't see much, but uh, we did actually change a, a fair amount on the drainage system. So that infiltration system footprint, the big one, exactly the same. Um, we did make some other changes that I'll get into on that system. Uh, another thing that we did was that rooftop detention area got bigger, as uh, you saw before, it was split in this wing of the building. It is now all of sort of this front area of the building is part of that detention system that would then go into the infiltration system. And one of the more significant things we did is those smaller systems that were in the townhouse driveways are now gone. Um, the trench drains are still driveways and those collect runoff, which is now routed under these carports, these sort of darker beige, if you want to call them our carports and into that large infiltration system. So summarily, what this did is it allowed us to maintain our, our peak flow rate reduction while fundamentally infiltrating less water, which uh, addressed that um, discharge, that drawdown concern of GZAs. And I'll get into how we did that more in a minute. So again, that overview, peer, GZA's peer review, since we last met, they were brought on board to focus on really these, these main features, estimated seasonal high groundwater elevation of four, groundwater mounting analysis, the 72 hour drawdown. And then if any changes were to happen or if the groundwater mound were to impact the system's ability to comply with standard two, which is the peak attenuation standard. So GZA's initial peer review came out on August 1st. I'll kind of go through those items and what they found. Uh, the first thing they found uh, re with regard to our estimated seasonal high groundwater elevation four is that they concluded that that is an appropriate uh, use, an appropriate um, elevation for the project. Uh, these red and italics are actual quotes from their peer review letter. Um, so if I could read them real quick. Mm. Uh, they said the first one is, therefore, we conclude that the seasonal high water table elevation of 4.0 feet used by BSC is for, quote, above normal, end quote, groundwater conditions and is suitable to be used for stormwater design for this project. As noted above, GZA's opinion on design groundwater elevation findings are consistent with the opinion expressed by Hatch and BSC. And then they further went on to say, Note that we did not use USGS well Lexington MA-LTW-104, which was used by MMA and Horsley in our analysis because that well is in a sand and gravel aquifer with a very shallow water table. Those conditions are not present at the site. In addition, that USGS well is more affected by individual rainfall events than by seasonal variations of the groundwater table, which is not typical of other USGS wells in the area. So on the first point that they were brought on board to, to look at our groundwater elevation in their initial review, they concluded that that elevation of 4.0 was appropriate. On the groundwater mounding analysis, um, while they concurred with our methodology and they agreed that the required recharge volume could be infiltrated without excessive groundwater, they did express some concerns with regard to the full volume of the system. If you remember the way that set up is there's the required recharge volume, which is around 1600, 1700 cubic, there is 1638 cubic feet. But that system was set up in a way where the outlet from it was set high and so the total volume of recharge that would go into the ground from that system was a little over 10,000 cubic feet. So what GZA looked at was 
that required recharge volume would infiltrate fine without a groundwater mounting issue, but somewhere after that point, the groundwater mound would hit the bottom of the system, reduce the soil's ability to infiltrate, and not allow that 10,000 something cubic feet of water to draw down within 72 hours. Uh, so the quote from that is, it is GZA's opinion that the required recharge volume of 1,638 cubic feet can be infiltrated into the ground without causing excessive groundwater mounding. However, for stormwater volumes larger than 1,638 cubic feet, the rate of infiltration will decrease significantly and the groundwater mound will extend into the bottom of the infiltration system. So as I was saying, that's really where they concluded that that 72 hour drawdown would not be met. That's, as I said, a requirement of standard three. And again, what they said, as noted above, the required recharge volume is 1,638 cubic feet, but the main stormwater infiltration system has a storage volume of 10,497 cubic feet. It is GZA's opinion that the large main stormwater infiltration system would need to be redesigned to allow drainage of the system within 72 hours to meet the requirements of the Mass DEP stormwater handbook and to account for the impacts of groundwater mounding during storm events, which result in greater than 1,638 cubic feet of stormwater runoff. The redesign should also address peak flow rates that discharge the stormwater outfall control system. So that last part was really addressing any redesign wouldn't just have to meet that requirement, it would also have to still meet um, the peak flow rate reduction standard too. So after receiving that letter, this is when we kind of regrouped, looked at what we could do, and these are the changes that we made. So as I said, the uh, underground chambers and the townhouse driveways, they were an R tank, it's just a modular system. Um, we eliminated those entirely. Those trench drains were rerouted to that large infiltration system. Um, by the main building in the parking lot. And that, again, that main building roof detention system was expanded, you know, a fair amount um, to allow us to hold back more water. The other thing that that achieved is it, the rest of the roof of the building was just discharged to the surface out back. So this actually allows us to have less of that, which reduced the peak flow rate from that. And then we made some, most of our revisions were in that main infiltration system. So the first thing we did was we actually raised it up six inches. So if you remember, uh, the bottom of that system was set at elevation six, two feet above seasonal high groundwater. Uh, we actually raised it up to 6.5. At the same time, um, we made the system itself six inches shorter so that the top of the system is in the same location. So. These are storm trap units. If you remember, they're a modular concrete um, chamber system. Um, they were three feet interior height. They're now two and a half feet interior height. And the reason we were able to do that is prior to, I said, we just, we basically just had an outlet pipe set above, you know, at some elevation higher than the bottom of the system. Um, what we now have is an out, a real outlet control structure. So the outlet pipe set a little bit above the bottom of the system to um, get that required recharge and water quality volume to still infiltrate. Um, but that then goes into a manhole that has a weir wall in it. So basically it's a regular manhole inside that manhole, there'll be a wall in the middle. Um, that wall has a small orifice at a lower elevation that allows uh, controls discharge really of the smaller storm events. And the top of that wall acts as a weir. So bigger storm events just flow over that as they're flowing through and discharge. And that's how we're controlling the peak flow rates. Fundamentally, what this did is it, it resulted in a, a much smaller volume of water being infiltrated. So as I said, we were at, a, I believe, like right around 10 and a half thousand cubic feet. We're now a little over 2,000 cubic feet. So basically cut it by about a fifth. You know, it's basically a fifth of what it was. Um, and what that does is it allows, it addresses that concern of GZAs where that total recharge volume that was going into the ground now doesn't result in as high a groundwater mound. Um, and part of that was also bringing the system up those six inches. It does still meet the required recharge volume and it does still meet the required water quality system. And the total system does still reduce peak flow rates from existing additions in all storm events.
So that was uh, submitted, reviewed again by GZA. Um, going through those comments, they, in their October 22nd letter, they reconfirmed what they had previously confirmed about groundwater elevation uh, at being at 4.0. Um, the quote from their October 22nd letter, it is GZA's opinion that BSC's design groundwater elevation findings are consistent with this definition in its entirety. Redox features were not present. Therefore, wells were installed, water levels were measured in the spring when the groundwater was highest, and the water levels were compared to historic USGS groundwater levels for a relative comparison of the type of spring conditions present at the time that the measurements were recorded at the site. As previously reported by GZA, the USGS water level well above normal at the time of the site recorded groundwater elevation measurements, i.e. the highest seasonal water table observed over the past 10 years. So again, they confirmed that 4.0. Um, we previously had a two foot separation of groundwater. Now with this raising that system up six inches, we actually have a two and a half foot separation of groundwater. They looked at our revised groundwater mounting analysis and conferred with that, con concurred rather with that uh, saying, the revised groundwater mound estimate for the 100-year design storm is approximately 2.34 feet using the same aquifer parameter values that GZA used in our previous peer review letter. This re revised groundwater mound elevation is approximately 6.34 feet and does not reach the bottom of the infiltration basin, 6.5 feet. So again, as I said, we now have two and a half feet of separation. We have a 2.34 high groundwater mound. Um, so it is not reaching the bottom of the system. As part of that, they did make a recommendation for a building under drain. Um, they said, we note that the bottom of the stormwater infiltration system is now higher than the proposed garage floor level of the new building that is planned to be located 15 feet from the stormwater infiltration system. The proposed garage floor level is elevation 6.0 feet. It is GZA's opinion that a groundwater under drain should be designed and constructed beneath the garage floor level in this area to address potential water infiltration issues. Um, we've discussed it with the applicant. Um, we don't have any problem with this recommendation. Um, if the commission would like to make it a condition of approval, we have no problem with that um, as, as those kind of under drains are part of the building design process. Um, we would request that that be something that gets submitted with the building permit plans and reviewed in that process. But again, no problem with, with including that. And uh, as far as the 72 hour drawdown, which was their big concern in their first letter, um, they did con conclude that this revised system would drain within the required 72 hours. It is GZA's opinion that the revised stormwater mound elevation Evaluation, sorry, provided in BSC's October 4th, 2024 report adequately addresses the impacts of groundwater mounding during large storm events and addresses the 72 hour drainage requirement for the infiltration system. The revised predicted groundwater mound beneath the stormwater infiltration system is not expected to adversely impact the ability of the infiltration system to empty in less than 72 hours. So again, they confirmed that uh, requirement under standard three. And last but certainly not least, they also confirmed compliance with Stormwater Standard 2. As part of the package that we submitted, we submitted updated runoff, uh, peak runoff rate calculations for Stormwater Standard 2, showing again that or that we reduce uh, our peak flow rates from existing in all storm events. GZA said, in addition, we believe the stormwater redesign adequately addresses the Mass DEP Stormwater Standard to peak rate attenuation requirements. So as I said at the beginning, uh, this project meets or exceeds the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, it, the, review, the design has been reviewed by both Hatch and GZA. Hatch demonstrated compliance with all the standards except for all of three, they had parts of three. GZA's initial peer review had some questions with regard to the 72 hour drawdown, but did confirm our seasonal high groundwater and our mounting methodology. We made a bunch of revisions that I went over and GZA has subsequently confirmed that these revised, this revised uh, system complies with standard three drawdown. Our groundwater mounting analysis is good. And very critically, they reconfirmed that high groundwater 
uh, determination, which I know has been a, a topic of conversation here quite a bit. So uh, we're very happy with that. And again, the project complies with each of the 10 stormwater standards that are part of the Wellness Protection Act. So with that, uh, we'll be happy to take any questions from the commission. I can leave this up, I can take it down. It's really up to you guys. Sure, why don't you take it down right now, uh, Dominic, and I'll just look at everybody and get their reaction. Um, so yeah, this will turn back to the commission. Uh, if the commission members have any questions, just, um, just start raising your hand. I see that Nathaniel's, um, yeah, sure. Let's start with Nathaniel. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, thanks, Dom, for the presentation. I just, just want to, uh, Chuck, procedurally, do we want to hear it all from GZA? That's that's fine with me. Just, if that's the direct, I, I mean, I just like to hear from them if they, if they have any further comment, if they dispute anything that Dom just said or anything. I think I'd like to hear from them before. Okay. Well, let's. I mean, you don't GCA. need to reiterate everything that Dom said, but just uh, okay, say fine. I'd like to know <laughs> if they have any additional comments or anything. Thanks. Okay, uh, David, uh, who's here from GZA? I'm just looking at a screen full of names at this moment. Oh, oh Trump, Anthony uh, Urbano. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, Stone Urbano with GZA. Yeah, um, basically, I think Dominic did a pretty good job explaining uh, what we did. We had concerns with the original design. Uh, they've made modifications. They raised the, um, uh, the bottom of the infiltration system um, and lowered the outfall structure. And therefore, they're basically recharging less water into the ground. And um, we ran the mound calculation. We, they basically used the same parameters that we provided in our first evaluation. We some assumed some conservative reason. But basically, we believe that the aquifer parameters that they used um, uh, in the mounting analysis were reasonable. It's just the way that they uh, interpreted the, the flow distribution. So we adjusted that. Um, and um, yeah, the, the mound analysis, we believe it was, I mean, the groundwater high water table elevation, we believe it meets, the, there's a full definition of that stormwater in the stormwater handbook. And so basically, it basically says if modeling is not present, then you basically get water level readings and compare it. And we believe they did that. And the comparison made it a very, it was a very wet spring this past April, basically. Um, and I think we had four USGS wells that we looked at, they all, Conferred that, um, so we basically believe that elevation four was a reasonable design uh, to be used for the seasonal high water table. And that's about it. I'm here for answer any questions, though. But... Sure, uh, Nathaniel, did you want to ask uh, an, a question at this point? Thanks. No, thank you. I'm good. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Anyone else on the commission that has any questions for uh, either BSC or GZA? Oh, I see that David Kaplan has his hand up. A few members now, but I saw David first. So David, take, yep. take the floor. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just looking at the materials, submitted materials, um, and there have been a lot of changes. And did you rerun the stormwater report at all? And was that submitted and I just missed it? So we we reran uh, the calculation, the, the pertinent calculations that, that changed um, and provided those. Um, the rest of the report, I mean, the narrative of the report would maybe change a little, um, but the rest of the report, operation and maintenance plan, things like that are all the same. Um, from that standpoint, really nothing has changed. Um, and as I said, any any calculations that didn't require a change, we didn't resubmit. Um, certainly for the record at the end, if the commission wants like a nice one final finished document, um, similar to the plan set, we'll be more than happy to provide that. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think we would like that. Um, and also I'm just looking at the submitted plan and looking at the outlet of the, I'm just trying to visualize how the infiltration system, the main one is going to retain water for recharge. Cause I'm looking at a, 
you had mentioned something about a weir structure that's going to help back up and allow the required recharge volume, I guess, to be retained within the system to eventually recharge and just and not be um, piped out. But I'm looking at the invert elevation of the outlet pipe at the bottom of the chamber. So I'm just wondering, can you help me visualize, I guess, how that yep. required recharge mm -hmm. volume will be retained? Yeah. And so basically what you have is, again, it's it's really that outlet control structure. So um, if I could share my screen again, I just, I brought up the plan. Um, it has Absolutely. It's in red that I probably easier to point to it than... Um, and this time it shared the right screen, which is nice. Um, so you can see here's the here's the system. This is that outlet pipe I believe you were talking about, right? So this has an elevation of six point five. It's it's a pipe. It's a thirty inch perforated pipe that's laid flat. Um, all that's really there to do is to connect this system to this outlet control structure. Um, this outlet control structure, as I said, is a is a manhole. There's a wall in the manhole. Um, and what it has, it has a 12 inch, I believe, orifice that is set at elevation 6.8, um, which is the same as this 18 inch outlet pipe. And then I forget exactly how high the wear wall is, but the for the larger storms. So what it does is the water that's coming through sitting in this system from 6.5 to 6.8, doesn't have an outlet so it, it's just that 0. 0.3 feet of of depth of water which is that 2099 i believe or something to that effect cubic feet of water and then everything else that's above that has the ability to go out this pipe and out the back to where it was discharging before okay no and that I'll that's helpful that answers my question i didn't i mean, just wanted to I was thinking that I wasn't sure that 0. 0.3 inches equaled the required or the uh, the 2000 plus recharge volume that you were uh, proposing. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big footprint, so. Yeah, okay, no, thank you. Yeah. I don't have any more questions at the moment. Sure, and I if I got it wrong, uh, I, I think I saw Mike uh, had his hand up uh, first, but if I'm wrong, then Find it out between you and Susan. No, that's fine. Mike, you're on mute, though. I just have a very quick question, uh, Dom, and that is regarding the rooftop storm water detention. Uh, with a larger volume up there, uh, what is the uh, timing for release of that water into the storm water uh, tank in the in the bottom there in the in the parking lot? Meaning how long would it take for the total? So well, it, it's it's going to be basically it's going to be controlled in a somewhat similar fashion to that outlet control structure I was talking about. So it's it's more about the rate that it's released. Yeah. Um, and and also the timing from the in other words, you're not going to be releasing that storm water during the middle of a storm, I assume it's going to be afterwards once no it it would start going right at at as it gets up there, it's it's similar to the, uh, mm. it is just detention. So it would start going right when it gets there. And um, mm. and that controlled release, it's just a, a sort of a steady flow as opposed to if you just let it all go, it would be a much higher peak. Right. That's what I was wondering about because if you were to retain that water to, for some period on the roof and release it once the system has uh, gone down, I was wondering if there was some thought about that, but if it's going to be able to sustain the infiltration and the drainage, uh, then that would be all right. Yeah, it's it's just part of, like I said, it's basically the same as a detention system. It just happens to be on a roof. Yeah, it's just more volume on the roof. Yeah, and, and so we had it before, and, and in order, as I said, to, you know, to cut what was just being sort of released, and, and from a peak flow rate standpoint from the roof previously, we made that portion smaller and sent more of it through this system, again, to just be held back 
and released at a at a lower rate. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, Susan. Thank you. Um, please excuse me if you've answered this maybe six months ago. <laughs> I forgot. Um, can you tell me what uh, rainfall data you used for uh, meeting standard two? Was it the NOAA? It, it's the NOAA, what, what the commission regulations call the NOAA plus plus. So you use so, the NOAA Atlas. We use yeah, plus the, plus. but the plus plus what what's right. in the in what's in the current version yeah. of the um of your regulations, which is more than which is bigger than what was in the regs when we did the comp permit, which I think you guys were at that point using um, NOAA plus. Or not, I I think you were using the Cornell instead of NOAA plus we, plus. We went to NOAA. Right. Oh, right. It was Cornell. And, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, it was a while. It's okay. But yeah, it's the NOAA plus plus. So thank you. Yes. I wanted that. I just wanted to yeah. understand that for the record. I have one more question about um, total suspended solids yep. um, removal, um, which averages 87%, which is which is good. But as as you probably know, the the draft stormwater regulation updates for the Wetlands Protection Act is looking at 90%. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you could meet that or, or is that, is that not so um, that's possible? So I, it, it's interesting that I have to look at how they, how they, so they're also, the draft is also, um, allowing you to figure that out a little differently than the current. Um, so for example, the current has some very set numbers for, you know, infiltration systems, you know, not for everything, proprietary system, but for infiltration system, catch bases, things like that. And mm -hmm. the draft uses the EPA curves um, from the MS4 permit, which then depend on actually to, for like an infiltration system, depend on how sort of what your equivalent depth of infiltration is. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I haven't looked at this particular system compared to those curves. So I don't, I don't know offhand where it would fall. Okay. Cause I was just looking at your TSS. You have it separated by area and certain areas actually meet 90 or above and certain don't. So yeah. then average and, them. Yeah. Yeah. And so we do, and, and I'm pretty sure that's still going to be the requirement in the new version is the weighted average so that if you do have areas you know we we do have a little bit of driveway for example i think just goes through a catch basin mm -hmm. um, and things of that nature um that those are offset by larger areas that have larger systems okay larger right. reductions so okay um is that something you could look at or is is that um yeah, I'm gonna have to dig it all up. You don't have to do it now. <laughs> I'm just asking. <laughs> is is that doable or is this like a whole big deal? Um, I mean, it's doable. I don't I mean I, I, I guess my, my bigger question would sort of be um is this just for informational purposes? <laughs> no. So so the reason is if we're meeting NOAA Atlas 14 plus plus. So we're looking at being more climate resilient. That's that's the way deep he is going with their standards, as we all know. Then this is another standard that we're trying to be more climate resilient and better for the environment. Um, so I was just thinking, well, if we can do the NOAA 14 plus plus, can we also do this? And so I, that's where I was, but and I guess I appreciate that that stance. Um, we we use the NOAA plus plus largely because it is in your current regs um, for mm -hmm. us. Which mm -hmm. when we started this, the draft regs weren't even out yet, and actually your NOAA right. plus plus exceeds the draft regs. They just right. one plus. Right. Um, so I, I guess my point would be, well, well, we can certainly I, I can look at it. Um, the current regs are a um and we do 80 no i understand that so mm -hmm. i i don't um i don't believe that this or any project should be held to a standard that doesn't exist at this point thank you i know nathaniel stevens has his hand up so yeah i was going to say a comment susan I, i'm not comfortable quite going on draft regulations from dep the stormwater handbook i 
don't remember what phase it's in, but I think people have made comments on it, but it hasn't been finalized yet. Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a laudable thing, but I just think we've got to remember that when they apply and what the regulations were and, and we should, I'm just not comfortable sort of trying to change the standards on them as we review this application, especially at this late point in the process, as much as I would like to, you know, <laughs> as you know, no, 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 no take in. I was just wondering if there, if it was a small tweak because right. there's yeah, several areas that are greater yeah. than ninety percent TSS reduction. Um, that maybe that was just you know an easy ask. But right. Thanks. No, I understand. Yeah, good. Good, yeah. good try. Thanks. All right. Um, I have an opportunity now on the. On the townhouses, um, you change the infiltration. The infiltration that uh, is being offered on those townhouses, is that from the roof to the gutters, downspouts, is that still being collected? And then, or what I thought I heard was driveway and then catch like some sort of drain uh, that goes into the system. Yeah, so, so could you go over that again? The roofs of the townhouses, the that hasn't changed. They were the roofs of the townhouses were going into that large system already. Those those small driveway systems were just mm -hmm. the runoff in the driveway, really. It was just there's a trench drain across the driveway, um, because the driveway towards the street. Um, it's just outside of, if you remember, the town has a, a sewer easement across the front of this property. Mm -hmm. And and public works had asked that we don't put any um we don't put any sort of permanent um structures in the easement so the the trench drains just outside of that easement that's all that the um the systems in the driveways were collecting and those are now routed to the back the same as the townhouse roofs and and since it's coming it's collecting water through a trench drain on the driveway is there a component to capture any sediment prior to entering the the uh, other chamber that it goes into? There is. So there had already been um, previously at the request, it, it, we hadn't talked about it a ton, but there were um, some drain base on the other side of the trench drain. There was drain basins with a, a two foot sump at the request of public works during the um, 40B process. Those are Whoops, you just, um, was it me? Oh, I don't know. Did I, did I glitch out? I don't know if it was me. They, no, he me. glitched out. I didn't hear him. I did? Yeah. Oh, yeah sorry about that. I didn't see. If he could repeat that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, there's always been a 30-inch drain basin um, with a two-foot sump downstream of those trench drains. Those are still there. And so and is that for each townhouse? Uh, so I'm I'm wondering about like uh, operation and maintenance. Who's in charge of uh, reviewing that and making sure it's cleaned out? Is would that fall to the homeowner association for those townhouses? Yeah, I mean it. The everything is going to fall under the the overall um, property management in the homeowner association, whether they they hire a property manager or or not. You know. Do we know right now if the um, the building part, I'm just going to separate them that way, and the townhouses would be under the same property management? Uh, that is a question I would have to defer to the app because I yeah, and that might and that may change. So I was just, I was just wondering. Opinion. Yeah, I was just wondering that. All right, but yeah, regardless, the the operation and maintenance plan will fall under the totality of it, and um, you know if. It, as I said, it hasn't changed because we haven't added any different BMPs. Um, in fact, I guess the only way it would change is um, now because the I think the R tanks had their own section, so that'll actually come out. But other than that, it's the same operation and maintenance plan. Okay, and the the pipe from these uh, from all those connections from all those um, townhouses that pipe has been reviewed in the elevation that it enters into the uh, main uh, detention basin or underground infiltration system that's that's been reviewed in the past and that height hasn't changed so the 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 roofs haven't changed no, no, I'm just the, thinking when it goes underground, ones, yeah. it's going to go underground and into yep. the infiltration system. And so it had to be, you know, 
cut into it at some elevation. Yeah. That height hasn't changed. Um, um, some of them have because we, we've tried to minimize the number of, of inlets. So some of them group together, um, but they're all, they, they vary from, you know, 6.7 looks like the lowest. Most of them are up over seven. Have you verified during major storm events that you won't get backflow through those drains back to the townhouses? Uh, yes, they can't. Uh, the, the top of that infiltration system is lower than those trench drains. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was all I had for questions. Any other questions from conservation commissioners? Um, Chuck, can I just reserve a question later that's not on stormwater? Absolutely. We'll okay, always, thank you. But it, well, we can stay on stormwater, right? We can always come back to the come back to the commission. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to turn this over to um, the attendees tonight, and but in particular, I think that we had uh, Scott Horsley here and Mike Mobile. And I think it would be good to hear from them first. If any commission member disagrees, just raise your hand now. But if not, I'm just going to, I see that Scott has turned his camera on. I'm just going to go with Scott. So seeing none, Scott, please take it over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if uh, Chris Like would like to speak first. I believe he's here. He's our client at the Arlington Land Trust. Chris, are you here? I don't see your name. I think you're here. I am here. Yes, I am. Um, let me um, let me see if I can also be visible. <laughs> um, just a sec. Um, okay. Hopefully, I am now visible. Um, I I simply want to make the point that um, uh, this uh, eighty-eight page report. Um, was not made available to the public until this morning. Um, we did receive a copy of it yesterday because I learned of its existence by reading the GZA um, response to BSC's report. Um, but Scott and Mike have only had, have had really 24 hours um, to look at the report in the midst of their very busy schedules. And consequently, I don't mm -hmm. think that we're in a position to provide the kind of input that we have been consistently providing to the commission thus far. So that is the most important point, I think, for the commission to bear in mind. I think, as you know, um, uh, Scott and Mike have provided valuable input to the commission in the past. These design changes are in response to issues that were identified first by Mike and Scott. And um, I, I think it's very, very important that um, a full opportunity for meaningful public comment um, be given. So I personally just would like to say that I urge the applicant to um, consent to a continuance of the hearing so that there can be an opportunity for meaningful public comment. And then, um, Scott, I, I know you have had uh, a chance to look at the report very briefly while, while you've been on the road and um, um, juggling a couple of other things. Uh, a report. Um, uh, I believe that a couple of issues um, sort of have uh, jumped out, but but these are obviously just based on a very very preliminary review. Do you, do you want to speak to that, or perhaps Mike would like to? I I leave it to you guys. Thank you, Chris. With your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'll proceed. Yes, please. So again, just for the record, Scott Horsley, I'm working as a consultant to the Arlington Land Trust. Um, and I just have, I think, four quick points. I won't take much of your time. First of all, as, as Stephanie Kiefer mentioned correctly, the last meeting was August 15th. That was 69 days ago. 
Um, as as Chris pointed out, we got the report yesterday. That's one day. So 69 versus one days. Uh, I spent most of my day driving and teaching at a famous university here in Cambridge. So I've been pretty busy, but I've taken a look on the fly, let's say, and I do have a few comments that I'd like to offer, but I do that carefully because I'm proud of my work and I prefer to document it and submit it as a written comment letter, which you can review. Uh, so these comments are preliminary. And uh, again, only because we received the report yesterday after since the 69 days when Stephanie Kiefer correctly pointed out, uh, it's been a long time. Um, so the next point, I guess, is the uh, estimated seasonal high groundwater. I'm not going to go into great detail. I respect GZA tremendously. However, I do feel I have some comments that I would like to provide, given their, their comments. I, I disagree with the four-foot uh, conservative elevation on seasonal high groundwater. Uh, I believe this site also uh, has very shallow groundwater, which is one of the comments was provided. Uh, I also feel that this site is responsive to individual rainfall events. We have, as you may recall, we went to the expense of putting a, a well in uh, immediately adjacent to the site, which in fact shows very quick response to rainfall events, much like the Lexington well. We'd love to have the opportunity uh, in more than 24 hours since we received the report to, to explain why we think the uh, in fact, the four foot elevation is not a good uh, estimated seasonal high groundwater. But again, um, given the fact we got this yesterday, it's hard to do that tonight. Um, so hopefully we'll have time to present that to GZA and you and the applicant so that that can be professionally and carefully reviewed. And we hope you have that opportunity. Uh, the next point is that the design change that we've seen, uh, and we heard it again tonight, is to uh, eliminate the infiltration structures up along Dorothy Road and instead spend, send that uh, stormwater to the primary, I believe it's called 1P infiltration structure. So essentially what's happening is we're concentrating the recharge at one site rather than five or six sites, which is sort of contrary to uh, my practice of low impact design, LID practices, which I've published extensively on. It's all going into one place. Uh, I understand, I, I totally understand there's a new overflow structure, which I also question. One of the commissioners raised the question about the overflow elevation. I also have that question, but nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that instead of five or six infiltration structures, we now have one. We're concentrating the flow to one place. Um, I did look at BSC's revised groundwater mounding calculations. And using their own calculations and input values, I looked at a steady state condition at the at the location of the infrastructure, now including the four or five uh, driveways, I guess they are, at Dorothy Road. And I am seeing about a four foot rise in groundwater under steady state conditions, not storm event structures, which would inundate the structure. I would appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to present that data that analysis, have it reviewed by GZA, the applicant, yourselves. Uh, it's, it, it, my, my initial review of it suggests that the proposed infiltration structure uh, with the concentrated flow will, will inundate it during uh, steady state conditions. And when I say steady state, I mean uh, throughout the spring season. And, I, and again, I, I don't. I have a preliminary calculation, but I'm in no way prepared after 24 hours providing the, getting the report to provide that. That would be unprofessional. I want to review it. I would hope that uh, BSC and I respect their professional ability would want to review it and GZA as well. Uh, and then my last comment is um, that I believe that um, you know um, we had recommended, if you may recall. Uh, back in, I don't, uh, quite a while ago, that a well, so series of wells and continuous recording structures be provided to measure groundwater levels. Um, that was not done by BSC. That was their choice. As I indicated before, that very affordable could have been done. Uh, they started monitoring and the levels they are providing are in April. And as we heard earlier tonight, um, 
those are the levels they're basing their uh, seasonal high groundwater. Our recorded elevation was in uh, March. We submitted that data before they started monitoring early in March. That is also consistent with the Lexington well. Again, we'd love to have the opportunity just to submit that data for review. But again, given 24 hours, that's uh, difficult to do, Mr. Chairman. So we hope that we have, uh, I think the word is due process, Nathaniel, to uh, provide the uh, data and have it reviewed and an analysis. This is a complex project. I think everybody would agree, including Dominic. This is a complex site. Uh, shallow groundwater, highly variable groundwater levels next to a wetland. Uh, it's uh, a altered site. There's a lot going on here. Let's get it right. Let's uh, afford the opportunity. We've only had 24 hours to look at the data. We'd like the opportunity. We can do that quickly, Mr. Chairman. We're not looking to delay the process. We would love to have had this report several weeks ago. So I will stop there, but I know that um, Dr. Mo Mike Mobile, who I've been, uh, <laughs> we've had two or three conversations, one, one over breakfast, one over dinner, uh, trying to get this together in the last 24 hours. And I know he has some comments too. So with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Mike Mobile. Yes, please. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I'm having some internet connection issues. So I'm joining by phone here. So I uh, I, I won't uh, show my face and have you uh, looking up my nose <laughs> uh, with my phone in front of me. But uh I, I, first of all, uh, Michael Mobile of McDonald Morrissey Associates uh, appearing or presenting at the request of uh, abutters of the proposed project, um, Arlington, Arlington Land Trust specifically. Um, I'll, I won't repeat Scott's uh, uh, preliminary comments. I think they, they do apply uh, in my case as well. Uh, I have a couple of items that have uh, stood out to me uh, based on the, the the brief review I've been able to uh, conduct thus far. Um, and so the first uh, pertains to the, the applicant's groundwater mounting analysis that's been one of the focal points of my review to date. Um, I wanna go back to, to GZA's first letter, that's the August, 2024 letter, uh, where they, they provide an excerpt from uh, volume three, chapter one of the, the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook. Uh, and that reads, in some cases, the infiltration structure so this is an infiltration structure that we're looking at, may be designed to treat the required water quality volume and or to attenuate peak discharges in addition to infiltrating the required recharge volume. In that event, the storage volume of the structure must be used in the formula for determining drawdown time in place of the required recharge volume. So that, that comment, as, as I read it, clearly pertains specifically to calculations that must show that the system draining within 72 hours. The Mass Stormwater Handbook does not say that when it describes how to perform a groundwater mounting analysis. In fact, when Scott Horsley and I saw clarification from Mass DEP on this specific matter, we were told, and we, we've relayed these comments to you, that under the conditions that apply in this case, the mounting analysis should be based on the infiltration volume produced by the largest storm that the system is designed to attenuate. And, and, you know, folks here can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I believe that's the 100-year, 24-hour storm. Um, the latest GZA letter, so right at the top of page two, of their most recent letter, suggests that BSC has provided a revised groundwater mounting analysis for the 100-year design event or design storm. Instead, what appears to have been used is the internal storage volume provided by, uh, below the outlet uh, elevation. Um, that's that's pretty evident. That's what's been done. And that differs clearly from the 100-year, the predicted 100-year infiltration volume. Um, and that distinction matters because if you use the predicted infiltration volume for the 100-year event, the mounting analysis would clearly indicate uh, adverse hydraulic effects and GZA and even BSC have acknowledged that it'd be a significant reduction in infiltration rate. So unless there are addition, the additional missing materials. Uh, I'm really honestly left perplexed as to how GZA is concluding that a mounting analysis, uh, analysis for the 100 year event has been provided. Um, from my view, no such analysis seems to exist. Um, on to the second point, uh, 
you know, and again, this is based on a, a brief look at an 88, 88 page report that was received, you know, a, a day or so ago. Um, I do see that modifications have been made to the design of the stormwater system. Um, and seemingly that's, that's in an attempt to attenuate runoff rates. I think Dominic spoke to that in his presentation, specific to the, the rooftop detention system. Um, you know, their, their October 4th letter specifically ste speaks to the enlargement of that system. It's, it's clear and it's clear in their, their calculations. Um, now, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you're willing to entertain this through, through you, of course, uh, I'd like, and I think it's critical to know if either BSC or GZA has consulted a structural engineer on the viability of that system, whether before the change or now. Uh, I myself am, am not a structural engineer, uh, but I'm, I'm more than capable of calculating the weight of water. Um, so just using the numbers directly out of BSC's HydroCAD report for the 100 year event, at peak condition, they're calculating that that detention system will store close to 14,000 cubic feet of water on the roof. Uh, that's directly from page 124 from their most recent stormwater report. Uh, the density of water at ambient temperature is about 62 and a half pounds per cubic foot. So you multiply those two numbers together and you get over 860,000 pounds of water stored on the roof of the building at that peak time. Uh, that's simple conversion. That's 400, over 430 tons. Uh, and my AI assistant tells me that's roughly equivalent to two, uh, two uh, statues of liberty um, without the base. So that's a, a lot of weight. And, uh, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm no structural engineer. I'm not qualified to make a professional judgment on the implications of that, but uh, it's clearly, it was a, clearly a large load to begin with. And now it's being made significantly larger in an attempt to attenuate rates um, because there were issues with the design to begin with. That weight doesn't include antecedent factors like an existing, a pre-existing snow load. Um, so that, to me, that that seems like uh, a pretty significant issue. And just for clarity, the increase uh, is really about one and a half times what it was. It was about, by my calculations, about 295 tons at peak before, and now it's, as I said, over 430 tons uh, based on their volumes that are reported. So, uh, again, I, I would urge you, uh, Commission, Mr. Chair, to ask both GZA and BSC, if they've evaluated the structural viability of that uh, that storage and detention mechanism. So I will um, I will stop there. Uh, thank you to the commission for your time. Uh, thank you to GZA for taking the time to clarify on issues that were requested and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, if you have any. Yeah, so we have Scott here and uh, Dr. Mogul. Let's find out if the commission has any questions for them, and then I'm going to go back to people attending tonight's hearing. Um, so anyone on the commission have a question that came up during their discussion? Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Um, thank you. Ch thank you, Chuck. Um, if I may, um, because maybe we could just get one or two of these answered right away, even though they're preliminary. Um, could I ask, um, Dominic, if, if the, uh, structure on the roof has been reviewed by a structural engineer that the stormwater detention, um, system, or do you have a, a comment to that or you'd rather not until you see it in writing? So the structure hasn't been designed yet. Um, okay. the structure is, is part of that is actually a condition of the comprehensive permit is is the the details of that roof structure um okay. the, the key part of that roof structure is the rate at which it discharges the water right right um and do you agree that the groundwater mounting analysis should be based on the 100 year 24 hour storm event uh i believe our Groundwater mounting analysis has been reviewed by GZA and they have confirmed our methodology. Um, so I believe our methodology is in compliance with the act and GZA confirmed that. Okay. Um, 
Could I ask, is, G, is GZA still on? Tony? Still there? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have any comments at this time or you'd prefer to wait for written comments to, to address any of the, um, the issues that were brought up by Mr. Horsley or Dr. Mobile? Yeah, I think um, if they could provide written comments, um, that may help. I can say that it was the mound analysis was done based on the difference in elevation um, between the outfall pipe and the um, basically how much water was stored underneath the outfall pipe. Um, there is some, based on what I've heard, you know, attenuate. I do, I do want to relook at how long the water is being attenuated that's being fed. There was an outfall pipe, so our analysis assumed that that water was basically going to be gone, um, you know, within a day or something like that. But if it is slow down, we would have to reevaluate the uh, the mounting analysis. So I could I, I could say we'd have to re look at that again. Um, but if that's from Michael's uh, uh, comment, basically we looked at the the amount of water that was stored beneath the outfall pipe, and that's what the mounting analysis was performed on. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, and I have one more comment since we're still on stormwater. Um, has our town engineer reviewed this revised stormwater system? Because I know the town engineer reviewed the original system under the comprehensive permit um, in working with the, the ZBA. But now that we've changed it, has our, obviously we changed it so recently, it would, um, I, I would assume the town engineer has not looked at it yet. Is is that a correct assumption? Anybody know? David Morgan? Well, that... <laughs> the engineer has not looked at it, no. Okay. Um, as a commissioner, I'd feel, even though we have peer reviews, I'd feel uncomfortable um, closing the hearing with without the town engineer's review of whatever the final stormwater system is. That's, I just want to make that statement. Okay. Um, is that all, uh, Susan? Thank you. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Any other commissioners with some questions at this time? Uh, just, Nathaniel has his hand up. Thanks. I just heard um, something that I think, again, this goes to sort of information management and documentation. If I understood Dr. Mobile correctly. He said that he did not see an analysis. He did not see the data that supported um, GZA's conclusion about a calculation that had been done. So I asking, I'm hoping Anthony heard that comment and could respond to say what he based his conclusion on so we can be sure that Michael and Scott received all the information. If that's clear. Yeah. yeah, this no, this is Tony. Yeah, I mean, basically, we said it addressed the hundred year flood because the um, hydraulically the water was going to flow out of the system over the outfall structure. Um, so that was our, uh, you know, and then what was left would be basically what would be going into the ground after the storm event. But as I said, I do want to just check the timing. I know there it, it is retained, but the, uh, the duration of how long the water is retained, I, will, I guess I, I need to look further into that report um, to check in on that. May, may I offer yeah. some clarification? I, I apologize. I don't have a hand to raise while on my phone. Uh, you, you can tell me no, and I, I will stop talking. But if you, you would allow yeah. me, I'd like to clarify. Go ahead. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, so Tony, the, the HydroCAD report provided by BSC provides the calculated amount of, of infiltration as a, a discarded volume. Uh, it's on page 122 of the, the most recent stormwater report or page 72 of the PDF. That, that calculated volume over the 72 hour period for the 100 year storm is 14,852 cubic feet. The volume that the mounting analysis considers is 2000, roughly 2100 cubic feet. So I think you and I would agree that infiltrating 
seven times the water over a, a longer period, admittedly, but seven times the water would result in much greater mounding. That would be representative of the 100 year event because that's calculated for the 100 year design event. Uh, and that would certainly indicate, you know, as I said before, adverse hydraulic effects uh, to the, the infiltration function of that system. I, I, I hope you understood what I said. If not, by all means, I'm happy to further clarify. Yeah, this is Tony Bond. No, I believe I understand. It's I mean, basically, the water, the, the, the larger storms are being attenuated. And, and my, the, what I need to reevaluate is how long that attenuation lasts. When I did the analysis, I assumed that that water would travel out relatively quickly because I was looking at the amount of the storage volume within the infiltration system. Um, but I would have to reevaluate to see how long that duration of the attenuation of that large storm event takes. Yeah, under, understood. And, and I would certainly uh, direct you to, to our prior letters where we did communicate with MassDEP on this. And, you know, it was pretty, pretty clear from their, their statement that that mounting analysis should be based on the volume associated with the, the largest storm that's being attenuated. And again, in this case, that looks to be the 100 year storm. All right, uh, Mike, kill this game. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to see if I can clarify the point I made earlier. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the volume being retained on the roof is now significantly larger in terms of volume, plus you're adding the runoff from the townhouses. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether the design of the stormwater uh, in the parking lot it has incorporated those extra volumes of water in the calculations about uh, infiltration. It has. And uh, no uh, change in in the uh, size of the infiltration basin in the in the uh, parking lot. No, again, because we we changed how we're discharging from. It was a very simple kind of just a overflow pipe before now it's it's sort of a multi-tier system that just holds back the water differently but it will frankly a lot more efficient now yeah but it will accommodate those extra volumes without any uh impairment to the system or yes. overflow yeah. yes interesting thank you So Dominic, didn't you say that the system is uh, larger than needed? It, it, Not it's... larger than needed. It was. It, it's larger than the required recharge volume. Okay, that's what it was. Okay. Um, However, well, so... if I may, so now before we were infiltrating. You know, sort of what what had to infiltrate as opposed to what could overflow was significantly more than it is now. Okay, uh, Scott, you had your hand up for a little while, but now it's down. Do you, would, you, would you like to say something? Yes, please, very very briefly, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, it strikes me just a couple points. Uh, obviously, very significant redesign here. Uh, we've had it for 24 hours. Uh, sounds like, according to uh, Susan Chapnick's questions and the answers provided, town engineer hasn't even ha started the 24-hour review. He or she doesn't even have it yet. And I think that's a good, really excellent point. Um, we'd love to submit uh, some comments for GZA, for G BSC, for the town engineer to look at if we're afforded that opportunity under... Uh, you know, normal procedures. And then the last comment I just heard is uh, larger than needed. Uh, well, larger than needed can go two ways. It sounds like a good thing, but we're from a groundwater mounding perspective, larger than needed means more groundwater mounding, which is our concern. We're, we're trying, there's a lot of stores. This site is largely vegetated now. It's been disrupted. We're a lot of impervious surfaces. There's a lot of storm water. We're infiltrating a lot of that. Um, larger than needed means a lot of groundwater mounting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that um, per uh, Commissioner Chapnick's 
question and other is uh, let's take a look at this. Let's get the town engineer involved. Let us submit some comments for BSC to look at because we're just giving, and we apologize, Dominic. We'd love to have given you more uh, great presentation tonight, Dominic. We'd love to give you written comments. We didn't have the opportunity. I, I had to teach this afternoon. My apologies. We'd love to give you something to react to. So Mr. Chairman, we would love to have the opportunity. We can do that very soon. Uh, Understood. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. I think that point has been made a couple times tonight, so I think we understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, David I, Kaplan. Oh, uh, if was that I Dominic? Just, like, I'd sure. like to clarify a couple things. One, I did not say larger than needed. I just clarified for you that it is. I think that was me. I said larger right. than needed. And I appreciate <laughs> that. And the second thing is that, um, well, I, I don't know if the, the town engineer has looked at it yet. It sounds like they haven't. Um, just the, I, I would like to clarify the record. Our report was submitted on October 4th. It was not submitted 24 hours ago. Um, so that time frame, it's not that they haven't had, they've only had 20, like it was submitted on October 4th uh, through the, the appropriate channels. So I do just want that on the record. This is not something we submitted this week. It's something we submitted, you know, 20 days ago. Sure. And I think I, I'd like to, Make sure that everybody knows, uh, David, I'm going to put you on the spot here in the hot seat. David, when was that sent out to the commission, the report that we're talking about? I don't have the date in front of me, but I believe it was the same day, the 4th. That's what I saw when I looked it up uh, this afternoon. So it was also sent out on the same day that it was received. Okay, I'm going to move but, on to David. Cap unfortunately, I don't think it was posted for the public. We're talking about something else, Susan, oh. but I appreciate that clarification. Um, so, David, I just wanted to make sure that when Dominic sent it, it came, everyone knows that it went to the commission on the same day. I understand, and, we, and I actually said that in my opening, that I understand that the public didn't have a chance to see this report until very recently. As, as a matter of fact, 12 hours ago. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, unfortunately, that's, that's where we are here tonight. There's a lot of different procedural things that are in the air right now, and we're not in control of every single one of them. But, um, I just want to bring out for everyone here. So they didn't think that the conservation commission didn't receive that report and didn't have enough time to review it. And with that, I'd like to turn to David Kaplan. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Um, I just wanna make sure um, understanding the difference that's being discussed in the 72 hour drawdown period. Um, it sounds like the analysis was done for, you know, the elevation of the water, let's say that 6.8, which was the over 2000 plus, um, and that there's an opportunity if the 100 year storm hits and that tank fills up and it's releasing water at its consistent rate, um, that there's opportunity for the elevation of that water over, you know, depending on how long it takes for that tank to empty, the elevation of that water over an extended period of time could impact the drawdown calculation uh the sorry the the elevation of the the mound and the drawdown calculations is that is that correct am i understanding that correctly maybe to tony or because it, do, it does sound like to me that um you know there um that this calculation does need to be reviewed um, um tony i saw you unmute would you mind answering that question yeah um no we yeah we we looked at the mounding analysis for a duration of a day and uh, the assumption was that the water from the storm event that was attenuated would be out of it but if that water is retained is still feeding into it mm -hmm. the duration of the mounting analysis would have to be so the mount i mean this thing can't mount too much because there's an outfall pipe so all the water goes over the over the thing but right. try to keep the water into and allow it to drain out 
when the storm is passed, um, that's where the mounting analysis comes in. So right. So if there's a higher elevation left in that tank over the over the day, you know, after the the storm's done or the design storm, I guess, is done, then it would it would change the uh, the mounting analysis. Yeah, if it was still being fed steady steady flow of water, yes. Okay. And, and may may I add to that, Tony, if if you don't mind. Um, the, the other issue is that once the mounding and, and Tony's calculations have shown this in, in a way that I actually haven't seen someone do before quite as clearly. So uh, I, I really appreciated the calculations in that first letter. Um, the, the issue is that when the mounding rises to the bottom of the infiltration system, the infiltration rates drop off precipitously. As Tony's calculations show, it's, you know, an order of magnitude or so. All of the calculations that have been presented to date going to the HydroCAD calculations that are used to show compliance with stormwater standards to the drain drainage time calculations assume a constant unimpacted infiltration rate. When there's clear evidence using DSC's own mounting analysis approach that under a storm event, the mounting is going to rise to the bottom of the system and invalidate that assumption. So that that's a, it's, it's a big issue here that remains unresolved. And again, it, it goes to my my initial point, I haven't seen a calculation that represents that really any storm event, uh, let alone the 100 year storm event that uh, would be the most significant. Yeah, so my I guess my an interpretation of the report was that the top of the mound was still under the the bottom of the, the basin and, and Mike and Dr. Mobile, you're saying something different? Yes, for that, that would that calculation was performed using sort of an imaginary case where that that infiltration system only fills up to the level of the outlet. What I'm what I'm saying is that during storm events, uh, the BSC's own report shows much greater volumes infiltrating. So if you use the the predictions for storm events to do the mounding calculation, you get much greater mounding than what they've already calculated. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Um, uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, can I just, uh, just to clarify for, for Tony, I'm hearing you say that you're. Nathaniel, you heard... you're, you're echoing. I don't know yeah. why. Some feedback, yeah. Yeah. Is that better? No. But I think we can make you out. So, it's not. It's not that bad. Oh, is that any better? No, but we can hear you. So why don't you try to get your question out? Or I can put it in the chat if that's better. But I just want to say, does, uh, it sounds as if Tony has heard information this evening that uh, changes some of the assumptions that led to his conclusions in the letter. Is that correct? So he wants to go back and examine some things. Yeah, Tony, could you uh, answer that, please? Yeah, um, yeah, the information that I've heard, I'd like to reevaluate. Um, I mean, I, keep in mind, this is for the worst case scenario during when the water table is at its highest rate. Normally, the water table is going to be a lot lower and there'll be, there'll be far less amount of but, but anyways, but for this, <laughs> What we're designing is for the worst case, which is a seasonal high water table occurring at the same time of a hundred year flood. And that's the condition that I have to um, reevaluate, uh, which I thought I did. And if it flows out of it within a day, um, all of my assumptions are correct, I believe. Um, but if it is a longer duration that water is being fed, I just have to redo that analysis. Um, if I may, Tony, if it helps you any, um, it's I know it's hard to see on the hydrograph tables because they're drawn out, but we did run those calculus for 72 hours. And the last inflow is at 34.7 hours, and the last outflow is at 37.4 hours. Yes, but the infiltration, which is represented by the discarded time series, goes from hour approximately four through hour approximately 44. So it's 40 hours duration of infiltration. Which 
which was not a question I believe that Cohen had. had. No, I believe it was. I believe he was specifically asking about the duration of the infiltration, and it's right on your hydrograph, page 123 of the recent stormwater report. All right. So I don't want to, I know, Dominic, you're uh, looking for that, and that's fine, but I'm going to see if there's anyone else here. It looks like it's going to take a few minutes anyways. If you find it, maybe you want it in written form. It's something that Susan Chapnick brought up um, for some of these comments. Is there anyone else uh, attending tonight's meeting that would like to talk? Uh, but before we do that, just Anthony and my uh, Dr. Mobile, are you set? Have you made your points? I think that uh, we got three, three points from Scott Horsley, two from Dr. Mobile. They were... We went back and forth, and I think what we've determined is that um, Tony Albano, Urbano would like to uh, revisit some of his calculations, and he says it wouldn't take that long, but it seems like there's there's been some question brought up to how he reviewed uh, a certain section. So <clears throat> with that recap, is there anyone else here in uh, that satanic night that would like to make a comment and have it on the record. Just raise your hands. You can use the reaction button and uh, we'll get to you. Reaction button to raise hand function. So you can turn on your video stream and just wave or um, whatever. I just want to make sure that if anyone is trying to speak that they have an opportunity to do so. Okay, I'm not seeing any. David, you want to confirm that? I don't see anyone else. I can confirm. I don't see any hands going up or any videos turning on. Oh, there we go. Oh, is that Marcy Shapiro? Do I have that right? I, yes, actually it was uh, my husband <laughs> is on a different one. He couldn't raise his hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Nicholas Hyde, 152 Lake Street, Arlington. Um, I was on mobile, so I'm over here at the PC. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing public comment. Uh, the only comment I have is that in our neighborhood, there have been uh, two new uh, buildings built, uh, residential buildings that are on the outskirts of this uh, proposed project. And it was pretty impressive to see what they did for groundwater mitigation. Uh, I'm not a... I don't work in construction. I'm not a structural engineer, but it appeared that they had basically dug huge pits, which they filled with tons and tons and tons of gravel. And you can just walk by these places and it's obviously been built on stilts, uh, which is pretty different than what this proposed project is. And it just, as a, as somebody who's not an engineer, not a builder, I'm not part of a conservation commission or any of that, but to see other projects built in adjacent directly, I mean, they literally abut the project that's proposed, to see them built in that way that looks like it's built for, you know, Louisiana or somewhere where it's up on stilts, makes me wonder the veracity of, you know, having a project that proposes underground parking and all these other things. So I just wanted to uh, add that as a comment. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. And the commission does know about those projects because they uh, were permitted through um, the Conservation Commission. Anyone else uh, like to speak tonight and get their comment on the record? Oh, I also just want to note that um, Representative Rogers wrote his comments in the chat because he had to leave. So uh, just want to make sure people see that. Okay. All right. Um, but Chuck, um, would you read Representative Rogers' comments into the record, please? Because we don't save the chat. And sure. if he intended to comment, I wouldn't want to lose that. So, Susan, I'm going to take Robert DiBiase, but I'm going to let you prepare to read those when we get back from Robert's question. Thank you. But thanks for the offer, though. <laughs> uh, Bob, uh, would you like to speak? Yes, Robert J. DiBiase of 29 Little John Street. I am a direct abutter of the property. Um, over the last year, there's been a lot of talk about water heights and whatnot, ground levels. 
And I myself have been a contractor for 40 years and have done my own pits in my own yards, which abut the property, and come up with much higher water levels than they've reported. I also installed a camera that would videotape anybody coming and going on the outside. Never saw anybody show up on the dates that they they claimed they showed up to do these water, water heights. I have people walking their dogs, you know, camera right on my house, aiming at my driveway, which supersedes right over Dorothy Road, but yet we're, we're accepting levels of four feet. Now, this is at the end of the, the wettest period, supposedly, but yet the levels I have are in the 50s. So I'm just a little concerned about the water table. I'm concerned about what heights have been recorded and concerned that some of the data wasn't taken and was done improperly. And that would be my comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are you okay, Susan? You ready for that? Sorry, I couldn't find my mute, but my unmute. I got it. Okay. This is from Representative Dave Rogers. Good evening, everyone. I had hoped to speak during public comment, but after listening in up until now, I need to leave the meeting. And that was at 8.29 p.m. As the state representative for the neighborhood around the proposed project, on behalf of the many concerned constituents from whom I have heard, I respectfully urge the Conservation Committee to be mindful of the many continuing concerns of the community regarding this project, including related to stormwater and flooding. In addition, I respectfully note that members of the state delegation remain opposed to the project as currently constituted. In addition, both the select board and town meeting in Arlington are on record in opposition. Obviously, I defer to the good judgment of the Conservation Committee and appreciate and thank all of the members for your ongoing service to the community. Thank you. Best, Dave Rogers. All right, David Morgan, you have your hand up. I just want to note for the record that David White joined at 839. But he's not joining as a member of this commission. Exactly. Okay. Uh, just an audience. Yep. David has recused himself of this hearing, but he's in the audience. Okay. I don't see uh, any more hands up. I don't see any more people uh, turning on the video. So I'm going to go back to the commission at this point. And I know that Susan had at least another question, but may have a stormwater question first. I don't have a stormwater question, but you're asking the commission? If yeah, we're have... back to the commission at this point. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Anyone else? I could uh, I could fill in some time if uh, you want to look for your answer. So, Dominic, you mentioned that um, the structure wasn't designed. Is that is that? So we were talking about the weight of the water on top of the building, and you were saying, well, it hasn't been designed yet. It seemed to be kind of like a, you know, pause that everyone had to think about. Is that typical? Um, is that the way it works? Is this um, standard procedure? That the building would not be designed at this point? Yeah, so there was uh, a comment that um, can, let me get that comment. So there's a, supposedly 14,000 cubic feet on the roof, the 430 yeah. tons. Did this uh, consultant talk to a structural engineer and you said, you know, no, it, this hasn't been designed. So this is what I heard. Right. So the building has not been designed at this point. The structure of the building has not been designed at this point. The detention on the roof has actually been a part of this project since before BSC was part of this project. Um, that that concept has always been a, a part of the, the stormwater. I, I understand that. So, so we're going to use the roof for uh, for stormwater, but do you, so what I'm asking is you're designing the stormwater prior to designing, um, I guess, the structure that will hold it. Is this, is that standard for, you see what I'm saying? I'm not talking about yeah. the stormwater. I'm talking about well, the, I know. the superstructure itself. The, the, the okay. building itself. Yeah. 
at, at this point in the process, the building is pretty much never designed. The building is never de designed. You, at, it's designed at the building permit stage of the process. Do you see any issues? It's, this may not even be your field, but do you see any issues designing a building that can hold that amount of weight? So it is not my field, as you said, Mr. Chair. I'm not okay. Here, so I'm not going to comment on the structural ability of anything. I'm going to hold off on Nathaniel. <laughs> no, I'm just good. Good, Nathaniel. I guess what I would ask is, I guess ask the commission. I don't recall us, and maybe I have to defer to David White. He's in the audience. I don't remember permitting a project before that used the roof to detain stormwater. We usually just focus on what happens to the roof runoff. How's it being, you know, where's, where is it being fed in, fed into, we have French drain into, into the ground, things like that. But I'm just curious if any other commission member remember, remembers that uh, us ever doing this for another project. Not in my 10 years. I mean, roof runoff has always gone down and either gone in trench drains or infiltrated. It's never like stayed on the roof. Right. Not yeah, but th years. this is not an unheard of concept with green right. roofs and other things like mm -hmm. that. Right. So, right. Okay. Thanks. And I noticed, uh, I think the chair of the ZBA is here. He uh, undid his video. I don't know if you had wanted to say something, Chuck. Yeah. Christian, Chris, uh, Christian Klein, do you want Christian to Klein, uh, say something? I, it's spotted yeah, by Nathaniel. Just very briefly, um, Christian Klein, chair of the ZBA, um, just as a part of the comprehensive permit process, when the building is reviewed, it is not reviewed at a at a stage where the building documents are ready for, for construction. It's been, it's reviewed at a time where the the building is still somewhat schematic. Um, it's well enough to find to understand what the project's going to be, but under law, the way it's intended is that it's not a complete full design. And so not having the structural design of the building um, at this time is not unusual. That was all I wanted to add. Okay. And and that's the point I wanted to make. I, di I just didn't want to leave it out there that it was unusual to not have um, the building design reviewed and um, and known about. So that was that was my point. It might have taken a long time to get there, but uh, but certainly that's what I was trying to say. Okay, so here we are. We've heard from just about everyone back to the commission. I know Susan did say something like she had another question that wasn't stormwater related, but um, does anyone else have any questions about stormwater at this point? And quickly, I see none, so I'm going to turn to Susan. Are you ready with your other question? Yes. And I don't know if this the um, applicant can answer these, but at least we can put them on the record, and it's it's something to address. So I went back to the comprehensive permit um, because we did say at the outset um, that you would uh, the applicant would ex accept. Um, the conditions in the comprehensive permit, then we're just permitting under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so the, the comprehensive permit did request the town engineer review um, the rooftop stormwater and any changes. Um, this is in I-16 of the comprehensive permit. So I'm just I would request that as well, but it, it is in the comprehensive permit. Then there is also a requirement of um, compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. And I'm wondering where that is, or did that get conflated with the planting plan? And part of the planting plan is the compensatory flood storage mitigation plan in those areas. I'm a little confused about that, so maybe somebody can clarify that for me. And then, um, is there anything else? Then there were a few comments. Um, Susan, sorry, could you yeah. maybe take one question at a time? Sure, sure. Just, so they just okay. you know, get okay. um, the compound questions I, I get confused on. Okay. <laughs> maybe others do, thanks. Fine, okay, so the town engineer review we know didn't happen, so I'm just requesting that as consistent with the comprehensive permit and 
with what we do in in the conservation commission. Um, then the yes, I, I think I sorry, I was just saying maybe can you just stop there and let the applicant answer your last year the question you just asked. The one about the compensatory compensatory flood storage. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Before you go, on, it sounded like you're going to sure. onto a third third point. So, sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. So that was what I was. So yes, the the compensatory flood storage mitigation plan is part of the planting plan that is within that area. Um, well, what do I still have up? Um, I have too many things open. Sorry. Um, just get to the right slide, and I can sort of show you if I could share again. Uh, just quickly. And so this um, this is not the full planting plan, obviously, it's just schematic, but these um, I don't know what we want to color the that reddish hatched area, those are the compensatory storage uh, locations, which is all part of that overall um, mitigation, excuse me, losing my voice and plan that we've uh, that that you've had reviewed as as part of this process. Okay, thank you for reminding me of that because I was looking for a separate plan. It's been so long. Yeah, it's and... all it's all kind of one big area. Okay, got it. So, um, as a follow up to that, um, I went back and looked at the our peer reviewer. That's SWCA. Um, they did a peer review, and we had I think it was. Mm -hmm. March 27th, 2024. Um, and there were a few comments that I didn't see were revised. So maybe I missed that as well. Um, so for example, the, um, the ISMP, which is the uh, invasive invasive management plan. I don't know what the S is. Invasive but, species management. Thank plan. you. Thank you. Invasive Species Management Plan, which I do know we got. Um, there was a comment um, in that letter, comment 2-2, two, two, that said, that talked about herbicide use and um, talked about uh, modifying the first, you know, setting up the first year schedule and modifying for adaptive management. Um, and then there was a comment number five, um, so, and a comment number nine. Anyway, I don't know if we got the final um, revisions and responses to those comments. So did we get a revised invasive species management plan? Let's start with that one. Um, <clears throat> no. Sorry, having voice issues, I apologize. That's okay. Um, been talking a lot tonight, apparently. You need uh, some water next to you or tea. I have some <laughs> and I've been trying to drink it and just be not blatant about it. Um you mm -hmm. believe that you did. I'm actually looking for it now. So I can okay. get back. So that may be me and I can't find a revision. Um that's why I'm asking. Um because there were specific questions from SWCA in that 32724 letter. Most of them you responded to, but there were a few I didn't see a response. Yeah, and I, I, I do believe that we had basically come to an agreement on all of those with SWCA. Yeah, you did. And then, but I didn't see the revision. Like if you agreed and said, yes, we'll do this, but then I didn't see the revision. So maybe that's just, I can't find the document. Yeah. And that's something you can look at later. I don't want to hold everybody up. Then, then there was also a few other things um, in that letter. So like an an updated um, planting plan with the wildlife habitat locations. I think that was L100. So I guess maybe I just need a comprehensive update of the planting plan, making sure that all of those issues that you agreed to in the SWC letter of 32724 were addressed, unless you have them already and you'll just resubmit them to us. And I can't find them. Yeah. I'm sorry about this. It's just, you know, been so long. I can't. That, it's hard to follow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to dig through my own files to 
to find the right. You know, so for example, you agreed no cultivars. You know, we went back and forth about cultivars. Right. But then I didn't see a revised plan with no cultivars, but I may have just missed it. Or maybe you were waiting <clears throat> for the end to submit all the revised plans. So that I don't know. Susan, if I may respond to that, I think that sure. some of that is when we agree to it, it would be then that it would be a condition within the order and then the final plans would would do that. I don't know that it, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have that document in front of me, but I think that that's somewhat of, of you know, a reasonable, there's certain items that we can agree that this will be, and then it will be baked into the condition, you know, that that was okay. a comment from SWCA, we responded and, and, and therefore we've agreed to it. So it would just be, you know, within the condition. Okay. So, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have, um, I'm having a problem pulling up our responses to see if there are attachments right now. That's okay. So, I, but, I did, but I, I understand you know, what you're saying. Yeah. But my recollection <laughs> is really that it had closed out and that if there wasn't a supplemental like planting plan or a filing plan, it would be that it would be a condition of approval. And we, we agreed to that, that, you know, there was no contest mm. over, so. Um, so, so, could Susan, I, could you... I just ask that you look that over again mm. and make sure that, yeah. that that was it? Because I thought a few of them required a revised plan, but I could be mis mistaken. Susan, let me ask you a question. Out of those yeah. out of those questions that you asked, and I understand the cultivar <laughs> one is something that we have as a typical boilerplate condition. So mm -hmm. I agree uh, with Attorney Kiefer on that. Is there any others that aren't boilerplate or not yeah. typical? Because yeah. that's when we would want the revised ISMP. Right. So the ISMP had some herbicide concentrations that were inconsistent with the required herbicide concentrations on the material that was proposed, the chemicals that were proposed. Um, and then um, it didn't have a, a option for adaptive management. It looked like uh, it had the years set out and specific things being done every year. And it looked like that was set in stone. Um, and SWC recommended a first year schedule and then an adaptive management. It had things, for example, um, it had an assortment of different management schemes, which is what we wanted to see, you know, mechanical, chemical, um, things like that. But it looked like they were not being done together for the same um, invasive plant. So some of these we don't have as standard mm -hmm. conditions. Um, and then there was another one about where the wildlife habitat locations were on the planting plan, um, just so we could make sure that when, when we saw the planting plan, we could evaluate it with where are the, the habitats. Um, we had discussed that, that was comment number five in their letter. So I think I think there were a number of them, um, Ms. Kiefer, that you are totally right that we would put as conditions, but I, I thought there were a few that needed so, to be addressed. If I may, um, yeah. so I did find, and I can certainly email this over, but yeah, there's an April 4th letter from okay. responding to the SWC that responds to those comments. And it, it talks about the, um, it talks about the adaptive approach, um, and basically, you know what we what we agreed with SWCA with, um, and I I believe that the the intent of the the habitat locations we we did submit a plan with some generalized ones, but that okay. that's very much something that is is really done more in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so as you get out there and as this restoration plan is is implemented. Um, I don't recall who was on the site visit that SWCA was at, but one of the things they talked about was, was, you know, there's some stuff in the ground in certain areas out there. And, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, field fitting of all of this for lack of a better term, because, um, you know, which, specifically which trees are worth is is really you know at the time i mean it can change from now till then we talked about there are certain um snags that exist out there that we're not going to remove certain trees that maybe have fallen that provide value that we're not going to remove um and all of that the intent is really to work with the commission and the town's representatives while that's going on 
to do that work, which is typically how that work is done because it's, it really is something it's, you can't, and I say, it's weird for me to say this as an engineer, because when we engineer plans, it's this goes here, this goes, and it's very deliberate dimensions and everything else, as opposed to that is something that is very much done. Um, you know, you lay out the intent and then when you get in the field and you see what the, the, the real detailed conditions of things are, you, you install them and, and you make adjustments then. And so that was always the intent is that this process, um, the, the final process is something that's really built in the field, but the intent and the goals and the targets are something that would be worked out with the commission. And obviously who the commission may, you know, implement as their representative in the field you know, and, and what their responsibilities would be. Thank you. I, I guess I'll have to find the April 4th letter. And yeah, see if it's I can, I can read it. Yeah. Okay. Any other commissioners with a question? Comment? Let me just sneak one in uh, for Dominic. Dominic, do we have a detail of the storm structure that is holding back the water for the infiltration chamber. The outlet yeah, control structure? Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there a detail for that? It's, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, I believe we submitted one off to look through the, uh, I have, again, too many things open. But again, it's a pretty, pretty basic standard detail. So certainly add that to any final plans. Okay. Going back to the commission, any final comments? Uh, I think that uh, as I understand it, we have some questions. I think most importantly, I think our peer reviewer has pause about their evaluation based on some information that they heard tonight. I don't know if uh, Susan's withdrawn this, but she asked for a revised ISMP. Um, then a review by our town engineer. And I was just told that there is uh, a detail of the outflow structure and then the updated stormwater report. So I think David Kaplan asked that, and I'm not sure if that was answered because I know that there was a little back and forth between Dominic and one of the members about that, saying yeah, that most yeah. of it's boilerplate and it may yeah, not the, be needed to add data. We, the, the report itself is, as many people have mentioned, the length of our uh, October 4th submission. Um, the report itself is, I don't know, four times that length. Um, so rather than resubmit everything that hadn't changed, um, and deluge you with stuff. We just submitted the stuff that has changed. Um, our intent was similar to a final set of plans that gets referenced in an order is to submit a final stormwater report with all of those changes encompassed and, you know, whatever date, you know, an October 2024 um, date on it that would be referenced. But yeah, the bulk, I mean, the narrative a lot of the supporting documentation hasn't changed. So rather than just resubmit it again and again, we try to, especially when the routes are as long as they end up being. Okay. Is that acceptable, uh, David Kaplan? I'm. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so we're just down to, um... We're just down to the review by the town engineer. And then Susan, I'm going to go back to you. The revised ISMP, is that, were you satisfied with that answer? Well, I, I don't want to create more work, but I don't like to have a document in there with herbicide concentrations and proposed methods that are not really what we're doing. So. I, I feel uncomfortable conditioning that. So then somebody's got to have this 
report that they're, you know, this, this management plan that they're using, and then they have to go to our permit and see if there's changes. I, I mean, I really would wish that it was right. And so keep all the information the in one spot. Exactly. So if you could just update the ISMP with the responses as you've um, made to the peer reviewer. Um, and, and I understand that some of the other comments about the cultivars, that's easier um, to put in a condition and we often do that. Yeah. Uh, Susan, I agree. Yeah, it's beholden to concentrations. You know, I, I would just even prefer it to be more general in that it's uh, herbicides would be applied per label and then we condition how they're applied. Exactly. And what's applied. Exactly. Any other comments from commissioners of material they would, uh, they needed to review tonight or before tonight's meeting or something that came up? Seeing none, that's where we're at. Um, it looks like we're down to two revised ISMP and uh, town, the town of uh, Arlington's town engineer needs to review the stormwater report and the stormwater changes that. Um, uh, Chuck, no, three. We three. We uh, need to hear from our peer reviewer. Needs to oh, see yeah, yeah. revise his. Yeah, I had that on my list, but I don't know what happened to it. Yes, of course, there's three. Thanks. And a revised uh, a revision from GZA. So there's three items we're waiting for. So with that, I'm going to turn it to uh, Dominic and uh, Attorney Kiefer, and we're looking for a continuance to get that information to our November 7th, 2024 meeting. Is that acceptable? Well, I, I will go on record and say that after 14 months of this, we had anticipated that this would be the end of the road. And um, it's, and, and I think that we have fully responded to all of the questions that have been presented and that there have been responses that have been provided to the commission by its own peer reviewers. And we're faced again with this hearing with another set of hypotheticals from from individuals who are not abutters, but are uh, professionals that are representing the Arlington Land Trust who have clearly gone on record saying that they're opposed to this and, and moving and moving the benchmark every single time. Um, you know, so it's, it's very disappointing, I would say. And, and I would hope that the commission would see the good faith efforts that this project team has put forward for 14 months being responsive and providing answers, good faith answers, and going above and beyond what is required under the act. Um, with that said, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, regretfully, um, um, because um, GZA has suggested they want to look at something, I, I, I'm, you know, somewhat constrained to say that, you know, we'll agree to a limited continuance. Um, but, um, Susan, I would like to go back though and look at that ISMP sort of thing and, and, and back with the April 4, um, because I, if, and, and maybe we can have a discussion with David Morgan just to make certain that that question has been cleared up because, sure. um, you know, I, I know that there was a lot of good work and we had, we had a really good hearing or maybe two hearings on the whole ISMP and there mm -hmm. was the March letter and the April follow-up. Um, and, and so, I don't want to create work just to create work because that also creates costs for the applicant. And the applicant has unfortunately borne a lot of expense in 14 months worth of, worth of hearing. And we agree that it's it's an important project, um, but we also were confident that what we've done has been completely by the book, completely in accordance with the regulations and handbook. But um, you know, if 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 GZA is suggesting that it needs to look at one more thing before it can. Um, we thought we had a clean report, then we're somewhat constrained to continue this matter. Okay. Uh, I just have to ask one question. Um, Stephanie, you said a limited continuance. Was that just a phrase, or do you expect to limit us to reviewing certain things? Uh, what I'm, well, Ideally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to 
limit it to those those discrete points that were reiterated for GZA to take a look at. Um, uh, the Arlington engineer, but I I think that that's probably, and I sorry, I don't have the benefit of reviewing a full comp permit here, but I think that that would already be baked into because it's it's, you know, as we had suggested, it's, you know, the full design plans are going to go um, into the building permit and that's uh, going to be fully reviewed. Um, but but also to your point, what I was referring to is um, I, I don't want a long extension on this. So. Yeah. Well, I'd like to certainly be done on the, not done, but uh, I'd like to, no. Look, November 7th is right around the corner. I'm not sure we can um, grant a limited continuance. I don't think that if it's up to the commission, I would advise us not to. I just think since we're not closing, then we're not closing. And that's all there is to it. So unless there's some contradiction to that. I don't think I would agree to a limited uh, continuance, but we can continue to the November 7th meeting. And if there's no objection from the applicant, I'd like to have a- Chuck, Chuck, yeah. sorry, I would ask Tony to see if he has enough time to get us uh, something sure. in writing by that time. And then in fairness to BSC to have them have time to respond by the next meeting, hearing, I guess. So That's two weeks from tonight. Is that enough time? Um, the one after that is the 21st, I believe. Is that correct? No. Well, let me see. Just, it, to, the just 21st, so we get yep. them both dates. Okay. It's either the 7th or the 21st of November. So I guess ask Anthony first, maybe how long it will take him to do it. Sure. Anthony, can you unmute do. and uh, let us know what... Uh, what your thought is on time frame for uh, kind of getting back into that one section that you want to review? Yeah, I, I could I could get my response out within a week. So, but then BSC may have to. Yeah, but anyway, so, but within, sure, a, so week, within a week I can get provide responses or basically look at it and see how it affects whether or not right. even it affects the our our conclusion. <laughs> All right, Anthony, and uh, obviously, I, kind of my head's in this this spot. Um, do we have to go through any uh, additional requests for funds? Was that directed to me? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, actually, when when I provided this, I didn't really plan on providing any formal response, which I just did provide. Um, I was just looking at a quick. BSC requested input, and I was going to provide it, and then you know value about that. So it would be some <clears throat> additional funds needed. Um, when could we see that estimate? Could you get that to us tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, I'll get you a number. Okay, so Dominic, I think you have all the information now. When? What is your time frame on a turnaround? And obviously, it includes funds also. And I don't know if you want to see the funds first, and then, or just you want to do it all at once. But the floor is yours. Uh, I mean, I will have to defer to my client on the funds question. Um, but I mean, it, as far as our turnaround, I, I, it's hard for me to say at this point because I don't know what Tony's going to say. So typically you go for the next meeting and then if it doesn't work out, you just continue. So yeah. I would suggest you say November 7th and then let's see if we can make it work. Yeah, I would, I would prefer that. Okay, hearing all that, uh, if there are no other questions from commission members, I'd like to get a motion to continue to the November 7th meeting. So moved. Uh, I have a second. Second. Okay. So I just should only ask the vote. Um, is this true? I should only ask the vote eligible members or just everyone, Nathaniel? Uh, eligible voters would be better. I mean, it's procedural, but. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do the vote eligible uh, members. So uh, I'm going to go start with Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Uh, David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. And then we can add those are the vote eligible members, and we'll just go Mike Gildas game. Yes. And who am I missing here? So David, so no one else is here for the, from the commission. So yeah. we're good at that. So, all right, so it passes. We'll be in touch with David Morgan about 
um, the estimate and things moving forward. And again, if anyone here has any comments or questions about things that we post or things are wrong on our page, we have a Thorndike Place page, please get the, that information to um, the Conservation Commission. Uh, the website or the email address actually goes to three people. So it's good to email when, you're have a, when you have a question because someone's there to make sure that it gets answered. With that, we're done for tonight. And since this is a special meeting, I'm sure everyone would like to adjourn as soon as possible. Can I get a vote to adjourn at 9.13? Second. Okay. Um, right. Sure. Uh, we're just gonna say, yeah. Susan Chapnick? Yes. Dave Kaplan? Yes. Mike Gildersgame? Yep. Nathaniel Stevens? Yep. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Good night. Okay. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.